You've got us here safely. The world's alarmed about many different things, worried about many different things going on from the volcano on this island, fretting about this and fretting about that. And Lord, the only thing that matters is that we're here with you. That we know your presence is with us. We know that all things do work for the good for those that love you and call to, according to your purpose. Speak today to us. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are just in tune with yours. That wherever we go, that we, we know you're there. You're, you're leading us. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. We look to what you're going to do today in our hearts, our congregation, in this city and in the world. Because that's who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lord. You are holy. You are great. You are awesome, Lord. And you save sinners like us. We thank you, Lord, and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
I wanna be near, near to your heart, loving the world and hating the dark. I wanna see dry bones living again, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am, the great I am. shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am the great I am the great I am I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my All of my heart, with all of my heart, I will praise you. I will praise you with all of my strength. All my strength, I will seek you. I will seek you with all of my days. All of my days, I will follow. I
my eyes to your throne. My eyes to your throne. I will trust you. I will trust you. Trust you alone. Trust you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone. I long to worship you alone are worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Yeah, let's give the Lord a clap. Awesome. Hallelujah. All of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough. You are my supply, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know. It's 
more than enough. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. Hallelujah, you're more than enough.
Then the glory of the Lord is filling this place. Then the glory of the Lord is filling this place. Then the glory of the Lord is filling this place then the glory of the lord is filling this place then the glory of the lord is filling this place Then the glory of the Lord is filling this place. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise and glorify your name. And we want to hear your word and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's greet one another. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I need to get your attention. We got a lot happening today, and we have communion, and there's just a lot of little things. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, a couple announcements, then we'll see a video clip, and then I'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, on the back table, there is a so, several flyers. Take a look at it. Online silent auction. It's a charity event for Jeannie's house, and um, it'll give you all the information. Eugene, where's Eugene? Is he in here? He can explain all the details on that. Uh, also, there's a women's fellowship starting up again. Uh, Please see the flyer there. Also, there's a little card here. It's for prayer request as well as contact information. I sent a book around with contact information, but I need emails. Uh, we're coming to the end of the year. If you keep track of your taxes and you, you, want, you, know, you want to apply it on your taxes, I need to have it so I can email you the form when it comes. And so... It comes to you quickly. You don't have to wait till the 30th of the month, hopefully, and, and uh, you can file your taxes when you're ready. Um, with that said, let's go ahead and look at a video clip.
Christmas. I have a Christmas message, but it's not the Christmas message you probably expect. Um, through the years as a pastor, one of the things I've observed talking to people, believers and, and unbelievers both, they tend to leave Jesus in the manger. It's important to understand that Jesus came. The Bible doesn't tell to celebrate it. But his birth is important because if he wasn't born, there would be no death. And if there was no death, there would be no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, you would be dead in your sins. So our Christmas message, with all the fluff and everything, will be on Christmas Day. Our candlelight service will take us from the manger to the light of the world. And the Christmas up until that time is going to point to the fact that who he is. And today, our message is our great redemption. He's our redeemer. And Christmas, in a sense, should be celebrated each and every day that we're so thankful that he came. He came to die for you and me. There is no greater gift than that. There's no greater love than one who would lay down his life for another. So when we go through this Christmas season, these are things that we need to share with people, things that we need to keep in mind and we need to be thankful for every day that he came. Not get caught up on, was it December 25th or was it September? Was it in a cave or was it in an end? We'll address those things later as we go through. But the fact, he came. And because he came and he died and he was resurrected, we can have life eternal believing in him. Amen. Amen. Let's open in prayer. Father, we need to hear from you. We need your, your heart, your will. We want, as we look in the scripture, to see your glory. We know your glory is vast. We know that we are becoming your glory as, as we're being transformed and, and changed and our minds are being renewed. When people see us, they know there must be a God. God, we thank you that we can be a part of your, your big plan, your picture. We're not afterthoughts. You chose us before the foundation of the world. So we ask that you would speak to us as we look at your word today. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray, amen. I titled the message, as I mentioned, Our Great Redemption. It's 1 Peter 1, 17 through 25. We're going to finish that, and next week we'll be in Peter, and I'll be able to tie it again because it's all about Jesus. Now, it's important to understand the whole human race is a family of bankrupt beggars. I mean, spiritually bankrupt. This is why Jesus had to come into the world to provide salvation because none of us could ever be good enough. If you were in the garden and you were Adam or Eve, you would have done the same thing. That was God's best without a sinful nature and you and I have that sinful nature. Man is simply left naked, poor, miserable, in no way could he ever pay the price of salvation. You know this. Perhaps you've heard it, read it. But do we believe it and do we live it? See, it, to live this means we have to live humbly in this world and, and really not focus on, it's really me doing this. If there's anything good that comes out of you, it's God. You can take credit for all the, the bad things. I've heard people say that 
Man is really basically good. Man is basically bad, the scripture teaches. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. It was necessary that he would come. Because of Adam's sin, man was helpless, hopeless, lost, and sentenced to death. And you cannot be good enough to save yourself. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. Notice what it says. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Wow. By grace... You have been saved. It's in our text today. Peter speaks of redemption for a lost man. I love that that, uh, phrase, I was blind, but now I see. That was true of every one of us in our life. We were blind until God opened our spiritual eyes to see. The things we did... They may have seemed good, but sometimes the motives were impure. But when God comes into our life, there's a change. When he comes into our life, there's this motivation for holy living. And we're called, as we've talked about, to be holy as he's holy. First Peter is a powerful book. It tells us how we're to walk through this life with the Holy God. It continually reminds us of the greatness of God. Look with me in our text, 1 Peter 1.17. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during this time that you stay, stay on earth. This place is, first of all, is not our home. Please understand, when he's talking to the Bible, we're aliens, we're strangers, we're pilgrims. This is not our home. God's prepared a place for us beyond what you and I could ever, ever imagine. Therefore, because of what he has done, It's important if believers wish to call God Father, Abba, Father. They really need, is what it's saying here, we need to monitor our conduct. While we're spending time here sojourning until the Lord comes for us. This is important. It's not just about a, a, a baby in a, a manger. It's not about just saying a sinner's prayer and then we go through life however we want. He saved us, again, from the power of sin, but he saved us to himself. To walk with him, to be with him. Now again, in Acts 13, 17, it uses that that word again, sojourners. Now I want to contrast this, aliens and strangers um, and uh, pilgrims. That's who we are. That's the believers. It's always defined in the Bible that way. What I want you to think about is in just for a moment, because as you're reading, you'll pick it up elsewhere, there are earth dwellers. I pray today that there's no earth dwellers in this place. Oh, I should pray there are that get saved. Earth dwellers are those that are really looking for this world just to go on as it is. These are unbelievers. When you go and you look, and you can look at this later in Revelation chapter 3, it talks about those earth dwellers. Revelation 3, I think it's about verse 10. But we, this is not our home. Don't get so rooted in this world that you're not ready to go at at that call, upward call that we just excite every day that we're living to, to go and be with him. 
it's hard as a, a grandpa or grandma when you're having a, a baby coming to think that way. But he wants us to think. Because we know the baby, the child will go with us. This, this place is not our home. And, and we're to be in this place a light and a salt unto the earth. And we're to, to check our actions continually. Are, are we living in such a way? Are, are we calm when everything is out of control around you? Maybe you remember as an unbeliever just for a moment, you know, there, there's this person that's just calm and everything's just out of control. And you're mad at them because they're calm. As you become a believer, you see that kind of person. You go, gosh, I want to be like that. A pillar of strength, and really it's Christ in that person. He wants to continually change you. He wants you to continually grow in that love and grace of Jesus Christ. And the only way this will ever happen is if you develop a relationship with him. You know, people can be married and have a relationship that's like this. And you can have people that are married and they're kind of like this. And some are like this. Eventually, there's no relationship at all. A relationship is something that you cultivate, you're aware of. How are you walking with the Lord Jesus Christ? When you understand redemption, and this is what we're going to be talking about, our great redemption, it changes the way that we live. This is why I say that doctrine is so important. Doctrine simply is that word meaning for teaching. What does the Bible teach about being redeemed? That word redeemed. It, it, it speaks volumes when you think about it. It's, it's a word. It, it comes from the, the secular Greek language. And it, it speaks of buying a freedom for a slave. You, you can't imagine what it's like to be a slave. But in that culture, that the, a person could be bought out of that culture. They could work hard enough as possible, depending on how they became a slave. But it's redeemed. For the older ones, there were blue chip and green stamps. We would redeem. We get these stamps when we buy things. Today we have mileage. We redeem our mileage, airline mileage. We understand buying back. The fact is the sinner. The sinner self cannot make satisfactory payment when it comes to salvation. The requirement that was needed was perfection. It required a, a sacrifice that was pure and holy, and we'll talk about that more. The curse of the law rests heavy upon every one of us in this world. And we were in bondage to sin. And, and this, I don't know, this is my little pet peeve. Christians, when they get mad at unbelievers sinning, it doesn't make sense if they're blinded by the God of this world. They're doing what's what? Natural. But if they're doing what's natural and we're believers, shouldn't grace and understanding come from our hearts? Galatians 3.10 says this, For as many as are the works of law are under a curse, for it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide in all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. No way we could keep everything perfect. It's impossible for fallen man to obey the law. But the law was, again, we talked about a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show us our, our need, our sinfulness. The curse was upon all people. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. We find that in Romans 3.23. And the debt of sin must be paid and we sinners cannot pay that price. Hopefully you've never been in this situation. But if you have, it's embarrassing. It's hard to owe a debt. And have no money to pay it. 
the bills pile up. Sometimes you want to take the bills and just throw them away or they come in the mail and you don't even want to look at them. You just, it, it, it's just the anxiety. The debt that we owe for our sinful lives was more than that could ever be. Remember, the payment must be satisfactory. A partial payment won't do anything. The best we can do is not good enough. Let me read Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf in our iniquities like a wind and take, take us away. doesn't matter whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. Here's the problem. Old Testament saints understood that problem as well as you and I understand that problem today. So let's look again at the, the purity of, of our redemption. Here we, we're seeing this need. Now let's look at the purity. It's again verse 17. If you address Father, the one who is impartially judged according to that one, conduct yourselves in a fear at the time that you stay upon earth. And in Hebrews, I'm picking up this thought again, and we're going to apply it in a different direction. It says, Hebrews 11, 9 through 10, by faith he lived as an alien in a land of promise. As in a foreign land, dwelling in tents, and Isaac and Jacob, and fellow heirs, the same prophets promise. For he was looking for a city which foundation, whose architect and builder is God. What city are you looking for? What are you looking for in this life? What do you hope for at the end of the life? A lot of people never think about it. They never think about retirement. They never think about anything until they get there. Or are they just going to say, well, when I get to retirement age, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to do nothing and roll over and die. Or when I get to retirement, then I'll serve God. And then they say, well, I'm too old and I have too many aches and pains. We're full of it, aren't we? We should have this longing. When you understand what God has done, we, we have this longing to be with God. To be with him personally. And when we see him, we're not going to do this. We will fall down on our faces. We will realize his holiness and his purity. We'll recognize our, our filthiness, even though he's imputed his righteousness to us. We'll be like Peter. Get away from me, a man with unclean lips, he said. It will fall down because we recognize that he has accepted us through his work, not our work. Our acceptance is what he has done for you and me. Verse 18, it continues, knowing that you were not redeemed with, notice, perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. You can't buy your way into heaven. There was a guy in church one time that got saved, and he knew he was, had a radical salvation, and he kept bringing money. I don't know where he had the money, but he kept bringing, kind of throwing the money at, at, at the church. I said, you know, you know, what's all this for? If you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, he loves you, just as you are, whether you give him a dollar or not, you cannot give money to find favor. You give money maybe to, to see his work go out and minister to others, but you will not find favor that way. Jesus shows you how. That's to love him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor oftentimes is the unbeliever that won't be living like you. Loving means you want the best for him or her, not condemning them, not judging them. 
Now, again, this, this word, English word, redemption, redeem, I'm playing off of here, is derived, of, again, that Latin root this time is a financial metaphor, and it comes out the same way as the Greek, the, the buying back. It's a liberation of a possession, an object, a person. It's usually a, a ransom payment. The Greek word goes a little further. It says to, to loose or to free. Free from chains, slavery, prison. Theologically, it has a, a little different meaning. So that when you look at it, a word could have a depth of meaning. And theologically, it means this. It's atonement. Reconciliation. Or salvation or liberation. That your sins, when Jesus died for your sins, the sins of the world is actually what the scripture says. He atoned for your sins and my sins. The price we couldn't pay. We were reconciled to him. Ephesians talks about we were enemies of him. But we were reconciled through the grace of God. We're saved. We talked about salvation. There's three tenses of salvation. We're saved the moment we believed. We're being saved and we will be saved. There's a depth in the meaning of these words. And when we begin to understand God had it all wired from the very beginning. Look at it again. Galatians 3.13 it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He, he bought us back. And having become the curse for us and is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. And Peter talks about that later. We'll see. The cross. This is Christmas. I know it's not the biggest tree. I had a bigger tree, but it wouldn't fit. One year I, I taught God's Christmas tree is the cross. Gift to mankind. He died upon the cross for you. And this is what Christmas is all about. He came with the purpose to die for you and me. And these things we need to be able to know and hide in our heart. And, and certainly on Christmas Day we'll talk about all the, the wonderful things of Christmas. But he came because he loved you so very much. He gave his life for you and me. See, our redemption was not purchased with, a, uh, with some valuable earthly silver or gold, as the scriptures already, already mentioned. You can't place a, a, a dollar value on salvation, can you? What if they do a, a large outreach and, you know, 50,000 people come and 4,000 come forward and only one gets saved? Is it worth it? You can't place a value on salvation. Paul had such a love for his brother, and that's the Jewish brother. And he wanted to be saved. He would give up his own salvation if it were possible. But it's not possible. Paul understood the, the value of, of salvation, how important it was. He wanted all of his brethren. To be saved. And we should want that same desire in our hearts to see not just our family, just those we know, but those we don't know. Those in other countries. Those who may not dress the way we do, look the way we do, speak the same language as we do. Whether communist or not communist. Or really have no politics at all. It really doesn't matter. Jesus come to die upon the cross. His birth was necessary. And this should be a jump start to take us right up to Easter. When we deal with the resurrection again. Now, we can't put a value on salvation like we value clothes and cars and all kinds of different things. Uh, do we get our priorities all mixed up? 
I'm always been amazed when I read in, in the book of Revelation, streets of gold. Oh, how I'd like to see that. But the reality of that, gold in heaven is like pavement here. Those things that you and I put a great value here, our value is all mixed up. We're going to walk on those things. And it's during this period of time as you're, you're growing in the love and grace of Jesus Christ, as you're being sanctified, we call that, that, that we begin to realize it's much more than you and I can ever imagine. And sometimes we can't, we can't put words together to figure it out. We, we just maybe sit there and I'm going to call it a pregnant pause where you just sit there in awe of God. All that he's done for you and me. And that silence will not be uncomfortable because your eyes are upon him. There's a facet of him that you've never seen. And we can't know him the way we will know him when we get there. When the end comes and this old world is judged, <laughs> but gold and silver will perish with everything else. But a redemption was not purchased with anything that is going to burn up. It was purchased with the precious blood of of Jesus Christ. The sinless lamb of God for you and me. That's why we're doing communion today. We normally do it the first of the month. But we did it last week too. And it brings us right back. It's all about what he's done. Thousands of years ago. Uh, before scientists understood the complex and the extraordinary life-sustaining properties within blood, and don't ask me to explain it, it's over my head. But in ancient Israel, blood was not only a metaphor, okay, a symbol for life, but the scripture itself says, again, in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. And look with me in Hebrews 10.5. It says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but the body you have prepared for me. A body, Jesus is speaking here. He will live a life without sin. He would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, that life is in the blood. We'll talk more about that as we go on, but it's so important. If you remove the blood from a person, that's it. God has made it clear that the life is in the blood and it was given for you on the altar. Now, there's this price of redemption I'm talking about. And at the same time, it's in verse 19. But with the precious blood, as a lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. You know, God invested, God the Father invested the blood of Jesus in our redemption. God gave his only begotten son. God gave himself because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit gave himself that you might have life. There's very little preaching today on the blood of Christ. In fact, it's often it's a Christianity at a period of time was it's a, it's a, a bloody religion without the blood. There would be no salvation. The liberals, the modernists downplay the blood atonement. They tell us the shedding of the blood was nothing more than a, a symbol of death. It's certainly the Bible's full of symbols and metaphors and it has a meaning. But Jesus Christ literally died upon the cross for you and me. 
his blood atone. Atone means covering. The word can be traced back, uh, uh, Noah's Ark, to the tar, that, uh, a pitch that was in there, covering. You're covered, cloaked with the blood of the lamb. God sees you just as you've never sinned. That's justification. Isn't that a wonderful thought? How important that is. However, the Bible is clear. When it comes to sin, Hebrews 9.22 says this, according to the law, one must also say all things are cleansed with the blood without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins. So when someone plays down that blood, when they say, well, eh, it wasn't sufficient, it wasn't necessary, as if there's another way, I can tell you that person is not going to heaven based upon what they're saying. Unless they're born again, that's the evidence they're not born again. They will not enter the kingdom of God. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. This is what Christmas is to bring life. You know, you have this child and, and, and no one knows fully what he's going to be. You know, when they're looking at him, mom obviously didn't know. Even the wise men, and we'll talk about them later, didn't know fully. The father did. He would give his only begotten son. 1 John 2, 2 says this, and he himself is our propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. So don't ever think that there are some that are just chosen for hell and some chosen for heaven. What Jesus did was for everyone in this world and they have to receive. It's a choice has to be made. God initiates and we either respond or not respond. Not to respond is to kind of turn your nose up at him. And there's consequences. Theolo theological term for making atonement for sin is, is making just simply acceptable sacrifice. When the father raised him from the grave showed that it was accepted, the payment, to die for you, to die for me. When we think about these things, this is the motivation to motivate you to, to want to live and tell others about what he has done and how important this is. Yes, the message, again, of, 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 of Christmas, him coming is, is, is essential and it's important. And it doesn't matter what day it is, the fact is he came, but the reason he came is what's important. Noah Webster defines propitiation as the act of appeasing the wrath of a person who is offended. Paul spoke of our propitiation in the book of Romans, let me show you in Romans 3, verse 24 and 25, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over our sins previously committed. What kind of sinner were you before you got, became a believer? Hmm. We don't want to talk about those things, do we? Those were the dark days. And, and yet, it, it, at one point, you might have thought they were the good old days. But, but when a believer, when a person becomes a believer, their eyes are open. They don't want to remember. In fact, Satan will sometimes bring those back and he'll want to haunt you. But you know, when you have made Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and trusted him, he has separated your sins as far as the east is from the west. What a wonderful thought. He chooses never to remember your sins. Now your wife, your husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, they remember your sins, don't they? 
But that's not what we should do as believers. Notice that again this, our redemption is based upon Christ's propitiation. The New Testament word for propitiation just simply means we get it from that, that word mercy seat. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? And this is important to understand that, that the, the, the lid, it was the mercy seat. This is where he said he would meet us on the, the mercy seat. Does anyone need mercy today? There's a, a I'm going to ask Juan sometime to do a song. And, and it, it, it was done by the Catholics sometime. And I think they did it. But the idea was on mercy. It would cry out to mercy. And I don't think we cry for mercy enough. We don't recognize our situation, what he's done. I need his mercy and I need his grace to keep pressing on and becoming more of what he would have me be. I can't do it on my own power. And please don't think you can either. We need his mercy daily. So this mercy seat, this is where God said he would meet us between the cherubim. This is where the, the blood would be sprinkled. First, the mercy seat was a, a meeting place. The mercy seat was the place where God said he'd meet and he would commune with the high priest in the Old Testament. Second, the mercy seat was a place, a, it was a, 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 a merciful place. It was there that, that we could find mercy. You go once a year before the Lord. And you go in and he, he would sprinkle the blood. The third thing, the mercy seat was a, a modeled place. Everything about that tabernacle, including the ark and the mercy seat, was a, a model of what was really in heaven. And this holy of holies is a very tiny place. I was in Israel one time, and you could actually go and see a full-size tabernacle. And you get in there, and you get in there with about 30 people. That's all could about get in there with 30 people, and all the oxygen goes out of this place. And you would see the high priest would go in by himself. And, but it was a place, again, where God said he would meet us. But this is... Just a picture of what would be in heaven. But we don't fully understand it. We, we know it was patterned what was on earth after what was in heaven. That's where the pattern came from, the model idea. Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands or a mere copy of a true one, but into heaven itself and now appear in the presence of God for us. So when after he died, he went out. That's where he went to. For you and me, our sins would be covered. Hebrews 9, 12 says Jesus was on his way to present the blood to the high priest in heaven when he said to Mary. And again, we, we see all of these different things refer, and I'm not going to tie them all together today. We will later. And then in John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to your brethren and say to them, I'll send to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Do you see the, the difference? My Father and your Father. My God and your God. And all of a sudden, everything is becoming very, very personal. Here we're, we clearly see meditating Again, he's mediating between God and man. He's the only one 1 Timothy talks about. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. He's the one. Father, let me tell you what Ron really means. He knows the heart. When we can't get the words out the right way or, or you know, we you know, kind of just ramble. Maybe not you guys, but... He's the one that intercedes. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God, one mediator, also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was more than what they could even understand. 
He was God in the flesh. 1 John 4.10 says this, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. It was all planned right from the very beginning. God knew the failures and he would be there. Another detail that needs to be pointed out concerning this blood atonement of Christ is that it was shed again for everyone. I repeat some of these things because it's a struggle. You may come from different backgrounds and, and, and some say, well, he only shed the blood for the elect. But that's not what the Bible teaches. First John 2, 2, he himself is our propitiation for sins, not ours only, but the whole world. So if you're sharing with someone, if you learn this verse, say, no, no, he died for every single person. There's a bunch of verses that line up with that. And then in John 1, verse 29, referring to John the Baptist is, is the one speaking. The next day he saw Jesus coming. Now speaking about Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. So he's sent in this world to be the Lamb of God. It's funny because every child, when they would have Passover, they would pass over, the blood would have to be over the, the door on the lintel. And the, the Lamb would be selected without blemish. Christ was the Lamb of God without blemish. And every child, this, this lamb would be in their home, and they would watch it. And, and, and when, you know, they were attached to it, the kids and everything, it, it was to be something very dear and, and uh, important. And he was the lamb, innocent. Praise God, it, it doesn't say the, the sins of the lacked, the sins of the elite, the sins of this special group or this denomination, and there are denominations claim, well, he just died for us. And the list goes on of people. He died for every single person in the world. He initiated, and they'll either respond or not respond. There's the plan of redemption is in verse 20, for he who foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. This is the plan of redemption. Notice our redemption was planned by God in eternity. It was already decided. He would already knew you and me, every one of us. You know, I can, I, I can look at my grandson. You guys saw him a, a couple of weeks ago, but look at my grandson. I can't see what he's going to be like when he's 35 if the Lord would tarry. But God knew every little step in your life and my life. You knew every sin that you would do. In fact, when Jesus died upon the cross, those three hours of darkness, every one of your sins, yes, every one that you don't want anybody to know about, it were laid upon him. He was atoning for your sins, his death. It was a plan. Peter's sermon to the Jews on the day of Pentecost said this in Acts 2, 23. This man delivered over a predestined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men who put him to death. God knew. Willingly sent his son into that fire, into that situation that he become the propitiation of our sins. God was not taken by surprise. His fall was foreseen, the redemption, and for whoever, again, was planned by the Godhead. Now, the proof of the redemption is in verse 21. Notice with me, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so the faith and hope are in God. See, the resurrection of Christ is proof of man's redemption has been purchased and paid for, as I, I began with. You know, it's important that Christ came in this world. We, we can celebrate it because without his birth, 
there would be no death, no resurrection. The acceptance was the Father accepted that sacrifice for you and me. This should be a celebration for us in our own hearts. Celebration isn't always making a lot of noise. It's just in our hearts, an overflowing celebration in our hearts. Sometimes I can see a person full of joy and it's like it's just coming, radiating out of their face. Do you know what I mean by that? And sometimes it's expressed vocally. God raised him from the dead and gave him glory. The resurrection is the, the glory of God. And one day, each one of us will receive glorified bodies. I like that. I long for that. But more than longing for that is just to be there. To see him and know him in a way I've never known before. Many men had died on these cruel Roman crosses. And, and this was about the cruelest way a person could die if, at that time, and that was the way that Christ died. He was treated as the lowest, the least. But God once and for all proved to the world through the resurrection and exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of Christ was distinctively different. See, it followed with a resurrection. That birth brought him to the death, but then a resurrection. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name which is above every name, so that every name of Jesus and knee will bow and those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is something that we don't often say. Jesus is, is, is Lord. Take that last part. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. Sometimes we just say, praise Jesus, hallelujah. But, but he's our king of kings. He is our Lord. He is our kinsman redeemer. And, and we should talk about him in different ways because there's so many things he's done in your life and so many things he's still going to do in your life. And this is the way he's revealed himself to you and me. This is his word. I know Peter wrote it, but we're going to see how Peter wrote it, moved by the Holy Spirit, leading what to write. God chooses to reveal himself in this way. He is your Lord. And the Lord means that I start the day with him, or at least I should. Lord, this is your day. What is it you're doing today? I have my bullet list, but what is it you want really done? And if he changes that list, is it okay? Oh, we say it's okay, but we get frustrated sometimes, don't we? Either he's the Lord of your life or he's not the Lord of your life. And this is something that we have to grow into and recognize. When we see him, finally when we get to heaven, there won't be this question anymore. We will, we will fall down. We will be humble. We will finally recognize all the things we don't recognize and know now. There's the product of our redemption. That's in verse 22. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for the sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Wow, that's a hard one, isn't it? Fervently love one another from the heart. We all, at, at different points in life, are a bunch of porcupines. We lift up our quills and we poke the people next to us, the people that we love and care about the most sometimes. Sometimes because of fear, sickness, all kinds of things going on in our life. But those things are good because it teaches us how to love somebody when they're unloving. Peter lists two products that automatically produce when a person is saved. Well, it's supposed to happen. Well, first of all, it's the compliance to the Bible, which I mean obedience to the words. And that obedience to the words produces purity. Purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. 
Wow, isn't that what you want to do? God's spirit, but somehow we will see him in a way that we'll see him with our spiritual eyes. In John 15, 3, it says, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And then John 17, 17, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. It is impossible to live a holy life apart from the word of God. Because you're being washed with the water of the word when, you, when you're daily in it. And apart from that, you're going to just drift. Psalm 119, 9. There was a song that was written years ago. I heard it was great. How can a man keep his way pure? By keeping according to your word. How does one get his life right with God? And keep it right. The question is quickly answered again in that, that song. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping according to your word. He tells us what's right, how to stay right, and how to get right. D.L. Moody talked about his Bible one time, holding it up, and, and the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this Bible. Have you found that true? If you're in sin or, or you're wanting to do something, it's hard to read the Bible. It's hard to be in fellowship. But when you finally confess and repent, and you come back to this time of refreshing, you want to be back in the fellowship and around with the saints. James says this, but prove yourselves, James 1, 20, uh, 22, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. There are many who profess Jesus Christ, but they're deluding themselves. They're not living for Christ. They're living for themselves. Who are you living for today? Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Our love for one another, again, it should be a result of Christ's love. It should just, his love just will overwhelm our hearts. You know, you, you sit there and you sit under him and he just fills your hearts. And it's so easy to forgive someone when you have love in your heart. Love covers a multitude of sins. And you let God work out, and you don't have to change a person's life. Most of those situations I find are, are really things of misunderstandings. They're not really sins. It's just we perceive things wrong. I'm not saying it's not always, but I have found in the long run. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than one who would lay down his life. Well, you know, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. And, and you'll find that you will be forgiving people. If you want to truly see biblical love, then you need to look at Christ. Again, John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. How did Christ love you? Sacrificially. He gave himself. And this is why I say oftentimes, you know, true biblical Christianity is about giving yourself first to God and second is giving yourself to others. Because you're fulfilling the law of love when you do those things. Sometimes we bog ourselves down with the, all these little things and we go back to the Old Testament. 633 command. wait a second. Jesus made it so simple. Love. Love. John, apostle love, got the idea. Barely able to walk in that time, they leaned him against a, a place. He'd come to speak with some people and leaned him against a, a counter or something. And, and it, it says in the, that he just said, little children, love one another. That was the end of the message. Would you just contemplate this week on just how can I just love everyone here? Everyone in your workplace. Wow. If you become that kind of person, then you're going to be that one that's calm in the, the midst of the storm, a pillar that people want to come to and, and learn from and sit at your feet, and, they, and you become their mentors. And your mentor is Christ, and all you're doing is just reflecting Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that the best? The command is a standard command. In Leviticus, it comes back to, in verse 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear a grudge against the sons of the people, but you shall love your neighbor yourself. I am the Lord. Again, Jesus builds on this so many times. 1 John 2, 9 says this, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. John 13, 34, 35, we've been talking about a new commandment I have given you that you love one another, even as I've loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you want to see the world saved? This is, this, is the, this is the evidence there's something different, especially when someone's wronged you. And sometimes people wrong you and they don't mean to. They're just human beings. Our love and care of one another gives a lost world a picture of God's love. That's how we're the light. That's how we're the salt. Well, again, the preaching of our redemption, we will focus on verse 23 through 25. And verse 23 starts this way. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living, enduring word of God. What have you been born again of? Notice, the living, enduring word of God. That's why when you get the word in you, it's living Hebrews tells us, chapter 4, it's sharper than a two-edged sword cutting as far as it needs to cut and clean. The Word of God is an instrument by which, again, new birth is, is preached. The, it, we preach the incorruptible, this is important, Word of God. It's the inspired Word of God. It's the living Word of God. And Peter spells it out in verse 24. For all flesh is like grass, all of its glory like the flower of the grass. Grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. It is the word which is preached to you. God's word is here to stay. This world will pass away, but God's word will be sustained. Psalm 119, verse 89 says this, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. In Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. <laughs> this is why it's so important we take the word and we hide it in our hearts. Because it washes and cleanses our minds. You and I have been messed up by this world. And the word of God deprograms us from the worldliness of this world. Changing and transforming our hearts, motivating us to walk as he walks in this life. The enemies of God can come against, against and blaspheme the, the, the scripture, against Christians, against this old book, but nothing will ever change it. It's, it's printed more than any other book in the world. It's read more than any other book in the world. There's more copies of old translations than any other book in the world. A few years ago, I'll finish with this. We had an opportunity to hand out 2,000 Bibles at the fair. This year, 2023, I should say, I'm working on praying upon handing out Bibles again at the fair. Not only handing out Bibles in the fair and praying for people and being available, and that means that you guys will be able to, in shifts, help with all that, to line up with some other Christian ministries side by side us. One that does Bible translations and plants churches around the world. Another one ministers around the world. So when the people come through in the fair and they go into the building and they'll be walking by and they're going to see all this influence of Christ. 
there was a guy that had been on a worship team for a while. Hadn't seen him. He had left the church. He had a problem with alcohol. He came up and saw me at the time. Talked to me. I prayed with him. Confessed some things to me and two weeks later he died of alcoholism. Sometimes we're there just for little things like that to get people back on the right track. Sometimes just seeing you there is a conviction. They know they weren't doing right. They knew they fell in a rut and they needed that encouragement. I've been in many situations like that. So I'm going to ask you to pray about that. But I'm asking more than that, that let God be the Lord of your life. Start walking closer with him every day and tell him you want to walk with him closer. And he will show you. And he will walk with you. And that walk will be more intimate than you could ever, ever imagine. I'm going to ask the worship guys to come up. They're going to do a song for communion. Come up, pick up the elements during that song. Go back and sit down, and then I'll come back up, and we'll take it as a family together. Let me pray while they're coming up. Father, we do pray for your will. We do pray for your glory. We, we thank you for your word, Lord, that we know is timeless. Lord, we know that it washes us as white as snow. We know it's living and active. Lord, we know we need more of your word in our hearts. We know that your word tells us what's right and what's wrong and how to get right and stay right. So, Lord, we just commit this time to you. Prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, it's about what you have done. It's about that you have come into this world just to die for us. Help us never to take that lightly. Help us never to be ashamed of that, that we would proclaim the gospel news. And this is a time to proclaim the gospel when people are open, willing to hear. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. At his feet 
the six wing seraph cherubim with sleepless eyes veil their faces to his presence and with ceaseless voice they cry Alleluia Before we take communion, I'd like to encourage you to take communion at home. If you invite somebody over for Christmas, have communion there. It doesn't have to be a little cup and little bread like this. It's symbolic. It's memorial. But it's something that we are to do. It doesn't need to be done here and with a pastor. It's something that you can explain to your friends if they're unbelievers why you do this. Well, someone might say, well, they're going to go to hell because they take it if they're not a, a believer. They're already headed to hell. Tell them what it means. Tell them the gospel message. Communion is for sinners saved by grace. Pray that God would open up their hearts and their minds. And it's a time that we confess our sins, sometimes to one another, sometimes just personally to God. It depends on that situation. But the world needs to know what we believe, who we believe, and why we believe. It is important. It's the only way they will ever know and come to know. So as we take this bread, it's a, again a reminder. It pictures his body that was given for you and me. We saw it was planned before the foundation of the world in eternity past. That he would die upon the cross. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When we had a bigger piece of unleavened bread... It would be striped and it would be pierced. He bore our stripes and he was pierced. It's been that way since the time of Exodus. That's what they would do. The picture was always there. So Lord Jesus, we take this bread as simply a memorial reminder. Lord, as we may have our eyes closed. We ask that you'd open our spiritual eyes to see your love for us. How much you loved us. Lord, we pray that we would seize the opportunity to provide for us to do this in our community with others. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. Thank you for giving your body in Jesus' name. Amen. Likewise, they took the cup. 
It's called the cup of blessing. It's really a picture, as we mentioned and read in the scripture, the precious blood of the Lamb. There is no salvation apart, again, from the shedding of blood. It's so important. The life is in the blood from cover to cover. God wants you to have life in him when you, the moment you confess and believe that he is Lord and Savior, you're born again. You're a child of God. You've been <clears throat> given this life, spiritual life. And we want to do this and we, we think, God, you have been so good. You've been so patient and so kind. So long suffering, waiting for me to come all these years. Lord, thank you. Help me to live my life and us, our lives, as you've lived your life. To live sacrificially for you now, knowing what you have done for us. We want to walk as you walk, in the light as you walk in the light. In the truth as you walk in the truth. We want to be a reflection of you, Jesus. So thank you for giving your life for us that we might have life eternal with you forever and that you are coming again. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the cup, please. And please stand for the closing song. While we were outside, I was listening to the message, and I just got so pumped up thinking, wow, this is great news. Even if you're saved, such a great, the gospel, isn't it great? Knowing that we're saved, my, what a great thing. That's why it's so good to be in God's word. That's where we hear his voice all the time. voice is this that is over the water the thunders and shake the mountains and plains whose voice is this that skip across the desert the wilderness sing at the sound of your name whose voice is full of wonder majesty untold Whose voice is this that is calling the nation to rise up and praise you with great shouts of joy? Whose voice is this that has called me from darkness and chose me before the foundation was laid? Whose voice is this? That calls me beloved and tells me I'm free and my debt has been paid. Whose voice is full of wonder, majesty untold. Whose voice is this that is calling his children to rise up and praise you with great shouts of joy. The voice of the Lord. Is calling his children, the voice of the Lord is shaking the earth. The voice of the Lord echoes like thunder, is awesome in glory. Hear, hear the voice of the Lord. Let those who
voice of the Lord is calling his children. The voice of the Lord is shaking the earth. The voice of the Lord echoes like thunder. It's awesome in glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Christmas. Let's not leave him in the manger. Let's proclaim him everything he's done for all those, for the whole world. Amen. 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 May God bless you richly. May we see you. Those can come Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. Thursday night at 630 and if not, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.